Welcome back to Online Trading Summit. In this next video, I had the opportunity to interview Nishan Arora, an up-and-coming top trading educator in the India market. Nishan is one of the co-founder of Techno Funder Society, a very engaged Facebook group of traders wanting to learn the best practices of trading from him. In my interview with Nishan, we discussed some of the key principles behind trading best practices and the issues that hinder most traders from becoming successful. He also shared some ideas on how traders can overcome their issues to become a more profitable and proficient trader. So let's head in and listen to our conversation. Hi Nishan, uh, welcome to Online Trading Summit. How's everything going for you in India right now? Yeah, hi Philip, it's, it's wonderful. You know, at, at the outset, let me congratulate you and you know, to, to, to have conceptualized and more than that, executed such a wonderful event, you know, which, which brings together so many wonderful traders across the globe. It, 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 it gives a sense of fraternity to all the traders and, and most importantly, you know, for, for beginners, they can just they can learn so many things without even leaving the comforts of their home. It's it's wonderful. I think it's one of its kind. You know, I let me just add when I was starting, there was nothing like that before. Yeah, I, exactly. I hope you could have you could have started this ten years, eleven years ago when I was starting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think partly it's also because of the technology improvements. That's why we are able to do things like this across yeah. the en entire world. And, and, and really, thank you so much for agreeing to come on board uh, this summit as one of the speakers to share your experience. So, um, my pleasure, I, my pleasure. And, and, and I, I remember when I was actually posting on the social media about, uh, about me going to be doing an interview with you and ask for questions from the community and the audience. Your, your, your image and, and your video actually attract the most number of likes and the most number of questions. So it seems like the audience and the participation in, in your Facebook group, they are really, really engaged with the kind of teachings. And I hope that uh, this video will be able to offer them even more insights about your personal life as a trader and as well as to provide more inspiration um, for, them, for them as well. So um, before we actually start off with today's interview uh, more in depth about your thoughts about trading, I think it's really useful and helpful if we could get you to share a bit about um, how your trading journey started right from the very start. So would you mind like sharing and, and, and diving a bit in a more about uh, when was the first time that you actually got in touch with the like financial markets? How long ago was that? And then how was that experience like for you? You know, Philip, uh, firstly, let me, let me tell you that, you know, when you said that when you, when you posted the promotion, promotional videos on Twitter and Facebook and my video got most likes and most comments and most views, I am full of gratitude for that. You know, I, I must thank all the members of TFS, so just, just for the records, TFS is Techno Funder Society, you know, a blog and a group that I run on Facebook as well as Twitter. So all the members are wonderful. We are 16,000 members now on Facebook and uh, some 6,000 followers on Twitter. And so much love, you know, has been given to me by, by the fraternity, by the members that I just can't explain in words here. So let me, let me start by that. Okay, now, now coming on to my, my journey. Um, you know, if you, if, if I start from the very beginning, so I, I, I come from a very uh, middle class family. When I say middle class, my father was uh, uh, an, an accountant in a private company and my mother ran a school. Okay. And it's a small school. It's, it's not that big school, but it's a small school. And there are some four or 500 students that she manages. So I come from that, that uh, background and Having said that, since my mother has been running a school, she made sure that I read a lot. You know, she never went, she, she, she never wanted to feel embarrassed that the, the son of a, of a school teacher, you know, <laughs> academics should be very, very strong. So, uh, so she always, you know, that's, that's my biggest inspiration. She always encouraged me to read books, read more and more about everything. And, and that's where the seed was planted. Now, going forward, uh, when I went to college, uh, I, I, did a, I did computer engineering uh, as my graduation, though I don't use anything about that in my life. I don't even know why I did that. You know, you do things when you're young. <laughs> uh, post that, I did my MBA in marketing. And uh, 
I was uh, I was recruited as in, in campus placement in a in a multinational company as a sales executive. But you see, uh, I, I I was always uh, you know a bit of a I, I always had a type A personality. You know, I always wanted to do something. But in in big companies, you know, in big MNCs, you actually don't have much to do. You you are given certain certain things to do, and you have to be in that those limits. So I left in six months. You know, you know why? I left in six months, and and I I joined a very very uh, you know small company, small in the sense that it was uh, it was a dealer of HP computers, HP and IBM and 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 too many brands. It was it was a dealer, and I took a pay cut of of more than fifty percent in my in my shift. But I was very, very, you know, uh, straight that I want to learn more about business. And that small company gave me a lot of opportunities. So I started my career as a ground salesman. You know, there, there can be, it, it's, it's the lowest you can be. You see, I was the lowest guy in the company. So I, my job was to, to move around on the ground. I was given a territory that I have to move around in that territory and find customers. I have to make customers, no fixed customers. I have to make them from the scratch. And you see, then the reality hits you on the face. Up till now, I was thinking that I am an MBA in marketing, but then the life punches you in the nose. And, and even, even the security guard outside the company, he rejects you that go away, you don't have any appointment. So that's where my journey actually started. You know, it, it was full of struggle. It was full of, full of sweat and blood. And from there on, I graduated more and more and more and more. And, and you know, uh, eventually I, I got to a position where I was heading the entire sales department in that company. And then, you know, I felt that, that the entrepreneurial spirit in me, it's, it's, I cannot contain it anymore. I had to stop it and I had to do something else. And then, you know, I started, an, uh, I, I started a small venture in event management. I did a small event management um, event for, for two, three um, uh, clients. And then I got an opportunity, you know, in, in, in exports. I learned more and more and more and more about exports. And, you know, if you, as I said, that I was always a voracious reader. I read everything that I could know about exports. I traveled across the globe. And, you know, Philip, you are from Singapore. My market was Myanmar. So it was very close by. And... <laughs> Actually, there was a time when I was living 15, 20 days in Myanmar in a month. And uh, I made a lot of customers there. I was exporting FMCG. I was, I was exporting IT products. I was exporting, you know, a lot of personal care products. And that business grew big. During that, that whole journey, you know, I was reading along. I was reading business biographies. I was reading management books. I was reading everything. I, I got hold of a book, Snowball. Ah, okay. It happened to be Warren Buffett's biography. And, you know, rarely did I know that my life was going to change forever when I was opening that book. But I, I got into that and, and I, was, I was so stunned. I was, I was so free is that, look, I like reading. I like knowing. Knowledge is something that I live for. And here is a profession. Here is a guy who has made the fortune by just learning, by just reading. So nothing could have been better. And I thought this, yes, if, if, if something has to be there in my life that I have to make my profession full time, that has to be investing. So having said that, that was my first encounter with, with uh, financial markets. And Warren Buffett was the trigger that brought me to financial markets. And I got into investing big time. And you know, when you, when you, um, when you get Warren Buffett, when you get one-to-one -one with Warren Buffett, it is very, very... Uh, necessary it is very very mandatory it is obvious that you get to know charlie munger it is obvious that you get to know benjamin graham and you know when you know these guys buffett graham munger i mean you know you are booked for one two years of reading so i i, I read intelligent investor i read security analysis i read all the all the letters of shareholders that warren buffett wrote to its the, the shareholders of berkshire hathaway then i wrote I, I, I read um, Howard Marks. I read Seth, Seth Klarman. I was, you know, I was, I had a soul of value investor at that time. And, I uh, value and yeah. how long ago was that? Uh, how, how old were you then actually? I think I was, uh, I was 24 years old, 23 or 24. 
Okay, and uh, so you are one of those, um, like, just like me actually, you started off by focusing and uh, looking from a fundamental perspective. That's how you got to got into the financial markets, right? Yes. I see. So what it's happened? Good that, that, uh, I, I, it's good to know that you too followed the same path. Yes, yes, yes. I did as well. As like what I've shared in my stories many, many times before. So, but uh, the interview is about you. So I'm really keen to understand what evolved from, from, for you. Uh, from that point on, were you, uh, how, how long did you actually spend your time and your experience from a fundamental perspective? And when was it that you started to look at financial market from a trading perspective? Okay. So, you know, as I told you that I was already managing a couple of businesses. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I was running an event management company. I was running an exports company. And I was pretty settled in life, you know, if, if, if that's what you call. I was settled in life. So I was, I was uh, doing business firsthand. I knew a lot of industries. I was aware about IT. I was aware, aware about FMCG. I was aware about services. So obviously, investing in fundamental analysis made most sense to me. And I did a lot of fundamental investing and I, and I, I, I won't be, there, there is not, uh, there's nothing to say. I was, uh, I had my firsthand success in, fund, in fundamental investing. In fact, a lot of a big, big success came from, from that region. But you know, down the line, I, I started feeling that there is a big contrast between me and Buffett. And that contrast was that, you know, Buffett, when he started, when he started, he started with one lakh five thousand dollars. You know, it's a it's a it's a big amount. He started with that and he started controlling, taking controlling stakes in the companies. So and, and there was a big gap. You know, fundamental investing for those who don't know, it's about learning about a business, about its financials, about its assets, earnings, debt, its growth prospect, uh, prospects, and coming up with a value of a company. That okay, this is this is how how a company is how much a company is worth, and then investing if if the market is offering you the company at a margin of safety, right? So. But then, okay, it was all right with me. I was, I was buying companies which were trading at a big margin of safety from the intrinsic value, but I had no say over how to run the company. You know, there have been a lot of companies where I felt that company is undervalued by a big, big margin, right? And I knew exactly that what to do to unlock that, that value, but I can do nothing. Warren Buffett, on the other hand, he could do everything. You know, he was the biggest stakeholder in that company. He could sit with the promoter. He can, he could sit with the board and he could dictate how the company should be run. I cannot do that. So when there is such a big contrast between what he could do or what I can do, I thought that the methods should also be different. You know, if the situation circumstances are different, the methods should also, also be different. I was struggling with the thought that what should I do now? You know, it's not that I was not making money in investing. I was making big money. I'm still into investing big time, but I could do nothing. I could just put money in, in an undervalued company and sit, wait, I could do nothing. Then, you know, okay, uh, before, I, before I tell you that how I entered into trading, I just tell you that, you know, when you become a fundamental investor, you start, uh, you know, perceiving trading as something as, something as a bad thing. Most of the investors, they perceive trading as gambling. If you read any fundamental investor, any book on fundamental investing, they don't show trading in the good light. So do you start off have, uh, uh, having a trading in a bad light in, in the way you look at trading initially as well? Yes, yes, so absolutely. I, I thought that technical analysis is, is nothing more than tea leaf reading. <laughs> you know, because, because Charlie Munger said so. So, so that, that's how, you know, uh, closed I was. Now I'll say I was closed. But then since I was reading more and more, more and more, I got hold of a book called Trading Market Wizards. Everybody knows about that. But when I got hold of that book, I didn't, I didn't know that this is a legendary book. You know, for me, it was just a book. But every page, every page was answering me the questions that I had in my mind. That what to do, what to do when you are not in control it opened a whole lot new world for me. And by the time I finished the book, I knew that, yes, I am a trader. Am I, my soul is that of a trader. You know, investing is something that I understand intellectually. 
I understand investing. I, I can value any asset. I can value any company. There's no question, but that's intellectual, right? Trading is something that appeals here in my heart. So, do you see, so the, the, the reading of that uh, market reserve book, do you consider that as like an aha moment for you in terms of the way you look at trading or was it something that slowly set the stage for you to want to learn more about trading? No, 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 no. It, it, was, it was spontaneous. So by the time I finished Michael Marcus, Bruce Kovner, I, I was damn sure that this is what I want to do. What was it that you read in the book that gave you that kind of very immediate switch of or, or enlightenment, I would say? What, can, you, can you still recall? Being in, being in control of your activities, being in control of, of, your, of your losses, of your profits, you know, being in control is the big thing. That's, that's completely lacking in investing. Okay. In investing, so, yeah, I am, I'm not in control. All right. So what happens after that? After you, you, you read that book, you get that aha moment that, oh, trading is something I should really focus on. And what do you do? What, what kind of actions do you take thereafter? So, okay. So, so I, had a, I had a pretty good corpus that I had made myself from my business and my investing. I, I, took, a, I took a part of it and I opened a separate account. You know, I think, I think that's the best decision that I ever took in my life. Um, I, I didn't know that it's going to be very, very fruitful down the line, but I always kept my investing and trading activities completely separate, right? So my trading account is, my trading account, DMED account, it's separate for, for both the activities, right? So when I learned about trading, when I learned market wizards, when I read market wizards, uh, obviously you want to know more about technical analysis. And, and I went down the same path. Then came uh, authors like Edwards and McGee, John Murphy, <clears throat> right? Schebecker, Wyckoff, Bulkowski. I read everything that I could do. I, I, I just, I'm a big reader. I read everything that I could read. But you know, there was something still missing. Missing was because, you know, it's, it's, it's like uh, uh, you feel that market is not a, not a laboratory. It's not a scientific laboratory. Whereas these guys, these technical analysts, they were portraying market as a, as a laboratory. And, and it's like you are a scientist and market is a laboratory. I felt a bit disconnected, you know, because I always had an intuition that when I read Michael Marcus, when I read Bruce Kovner, they were more of artistic traders. You know, they were artists. They were not scientists. So I, I learned everything about technical analysis that I could. I, I, I read Aaron Elliott. I read W. D. Gann, everything. But something was missing. And you know, only one guy filled that gap, and that guy was Mark Douglas. Mm. <clears throat> Douglas changed my life upside down. He gave me answers to everything that I wanted to know. And that was the, the, the second aha moment. Uh -huh. Right? Okay. <laughs> he actually put me on the path that I am on. And and thanks to thanks to Douglas, you know, may God bless his soul. Thanks to Douglas that I could, I, I am in a position where I am, I am mentoring a lot many guys. You know, if I talk of my, I'm, I'm just deviating from the path a bit, but you know, I, I realized that, that the path I took for trading, you know, I started from learning analysis and, and, and all that. I felt that every, every beginner goes on the same path, but, but they are not aware of that trading is not analysis. You know, trading is not just about, Technical analysis is a small part of trading. But I felt that most of the beginners feel that technical analysis is trading. So I wanted to uh, sort of, you know, destroy that cloud of confusion, you know, from traders' life. And I opened Technofunda Society. I see. And so, yeah. so when, you, when you got that second aha moment, what was that specifically about? Could you elaborate more on, on that? What was it that you noticed okay. that helped you clear that question mark in your mind about technical analysis and trading and what separates them or what binds them together? What was that, that second aha moment? Okay. Uh, so, you know, if, if I talk from a beginner's perspective, a beginner, you know, when he learns analysis, when he learns about trend lines, moving averages, Fibonacci retracements and, and all that, he sort of uh, makes a view, makes an opinion that markets are predictable, that, you know, I can predict the market where it is going to go tomorrow but it, it does not work. You know, you have wrong expectations. Mark Douglas told me that you don't have to predict anything to make money in the market. 
right? That was an aha moment that you don't have to predict because you cannot predict. There are countless variables in the market that you cannot know. Chart, a chart is just showing you a collection of people. It's, it's, it's a collection of bulls and bears and, and undecided participants which are moving the price, right? But, but you know, when I was going too much into analysis, I was feeling a disconnect. I, I'll just, I'll just uh, I would like to explain this in a, in a, in a more uh, detail, detail format. You see, when a trader starts trading, trading is the only thing where you can, you can succeed without knowing anything, right? If, 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 you are, if you have zero knowledge about archery, about, or let's say if you have zero knowledge about shooting, how much is the chance that you can hit a bullseye? Zero. If you have zero knowledge about brain surgery, how much is the chance that you can do a successful surgery? Zero. If you have zero knowledge about law, how much is the chance that you can try a, a case in the court of law and win? Zero. But if you have zero knowledge of trading, how much is the chance that you put a trade and you win? 50%. You see, 50%. That's a big illusion. So every beginner who comes in the market, he is bound to suffer from this illusion. Trading is most difficult because it looks most easy. So you can win without knowing anything. And you know, when you, I always tell my students that the, be, that the worst thing that can happen to you is that your first trade is a winning trade. It's the worst thing. So you, you, you unconsciously get into a zone, into a winning mindset that, okay, nothing, it takes nothing to be a winner. And you bet big and you bet big. And, and if, you're, if you have a streak of winning trades, which is pretty much possible for any beginner, you know, you are in for a big, big destruction of mindset. When the first loss comes, so you are, obviously you, you have to have that loss. When the first losing trade comes, you think that market has caused me this loss. You know, you don't think that it is you who is actually doing things. You blame market right from your childhood. You have been blaming others for everything that you didn't get. You know, my parents took away that toy from me. My teachers took away my moments of pleasure. My boss took that away from me, you know? So it's always others who, who do bad to you. So when you have a losing trade, you are, it's obvious that you blame the market. Every beginner does that. He thinks that market has done that. So many times we have heard the phrase that, oh, I lost money because markets are choppy. It's such a pathetic statement, you know? <laughs> but you go through that. And then there are only two, two consequences. One, that you develop an adverse relationship with the market, right? So you, you start thinking of market as, as some sort of an enemy who's trying to take your money away from you, who's trying to, trying to you know, uh, just push your head into the water. You think of market as that sort of enemy, but there is a big, big disadvantage. You know, market is like an ocean. Market, market does not love you. Market does not hate you. Market does not know that you exist. So, you know, there are, there is, as they say, there is, there is no beginning, there is no end. It begins when you put a trade, it ends when you exit. So it's, it's everything stops, starts and stops at you. But a beginner doesn't think that way. He thinks that market has done the damage. So he thinks of market as an enemy. But when you think of, of some, someone as enemy, you can never be in sync with it. And, and the biggest, the, the only way that you can become a successful trader is that you get in sync with the flow of the markets. You know, that you have no uh, prejudice, you have no preconceived notions against the market. That's the only way. The second thing that a trader thinks is that, you know, the solution of every problem that I have is analysis. Mm. I have lost because I, because I don't know much about markets. This is, this is a big illusion. And, and you know, Mark Douglas rightly said, it's a, it's a black hole of analysis. So once you start into analysis mode, once you get into that, you never come out. You know, I, I tell every student of mine, when you start learning analysis, it's, it's fine. You must learn something to, to start with. But you know, down the line, a trader forgets that why is he learning analysis? He's learning analysis so that he can become a trader. He forgets the trading part. He forgets that I wanted to become a trader. 
and you know he he gets too much into the academic side of it and he starts counting degrees and percents and and you know centimeters and inches of price movement <laughs> it's, it's just like you know he becomes an analyst and we all we all know that the world is full of great analysts but they are not good traders so you know the path of analysis begins begins and and once you learn something something about analysis you become confident that now i know about market right and and then you put on a trade and market punches you back on your face right and then then you hate the market more you think you need to know more about the market you you start adding indicators first it's rsi then it's macd then it's stochastics right then it's bollinger bands you start getting into that holy grail mode it's 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 very very uh, obvious for any trader so i i all i also traded that path and you know once i read mark douglas i came and and van tharp i came to know that this is not the answer you know the answer to all the questions all the questions the answer is that you have to accept the risk most traders think that they are risk takers right if you ask any trader are you are you risk taker he'll say yes i am a risk taker risk taker but he's not because whenever a trade trader is in in losing proposition he starts feeling fearful he starts feeling bad about it it means he never accepted risk in the first place so you have to accept risk and 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 if if you know if if i have to take the opportunity to be here and give one message to everybody out there every beginner out there that has to be this the outcome of every single trade of every individual trade is random yes it is random you know people think no how can it be you know i i am an analyst how can it be random no it is random the outcome of every single trade is random but the outcome of a block of trades over a period of times that is non random that is where the edge plays out right so as as i told before that if if you know nothing about markets if you know nothing about trading your chances of having a winning trade is 50% but if you learn some analysis the chances may increase to 60% 65% 70% nothing more than that right you still can lose 30% of the time so that the whole thing comes through trade management mind management money management risk management that you know you can you can lose 30 30% of the trades and you can win 70% of the trades right but you don't know the sequence of it your next 30 trades can be losers straight away i see so if you if you don't manage your money you won't even live to see the day of profits right so you can be completely bankrupt even if you have a have an expectancy of 70% <laughs> i see so so in, in a way i mean uh, so when you when you first start the technical analysis i think it's pretty much the same journey as how most new traders start off they think that analysis is that okay once i learn analysis then maybe my next trade is going to be profitable and if my this trade is not profitable maybe there's something about my analysis that has got some problems but they don't really realize that technical analysis is to improve the edge over a large number of trades and not for any individual trades so they just keep on diving into it and trying to find that holy grail of a trading strategy or technical analysis that they totally overlook on what's important uh, in terms of trading as a whole so you actually dis discover that 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 point in time and uh, so what do you actually do about that thereafter once you had that enlightenment moment do you change like something drastically or did it, do you just continue to refine your 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 already uh, your strategies in terms of how you actually trade you know it actually <clears throat> it actually took me around 2 years before i got this uh, moment so 2 years uh, from from the time i started trading for 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 two good years i was an analyst i was i was doing elliot wave analysis i was you know doing gan circles and and all that <clears throat> sorry if if you you know if you just trace back i i just uh, trace you through the history if you trace back in early 70s right i am just taking you through the journey of gurus people love gurus right everybody wants gurus alexander elder said wonderfully that beginners walk with their umbilical cords in their hands so that they can fit it into a guru so everybody wants a guru in early 70s there was a guy called edson gold now edson gold he he developed an analysis technology uh, analysis method called speed lines 
So they were basically 10 lines, which actually um, took uh, into consideration the angle, the velocity of, of, of 10 lines. It worked for three, four years, but then it stopped working, right? But Edison Gould, he, he didn't stop pushing the, that, that method over the market. Eventually, people stopped following him. Then came Robert Trechter. Everybody knows Robert Trechter. Robert Trechter was, was he was, he was uh, propagating Iliot, Iliot waves, R.N. Iliot's work. And he was doing wonderfully well for a couple of years. In 1987, right, he first, he first gave a cell signal and then he said it's a buy. And it turned out so bad that he lost all his following, right? So W.D. Gann, I mean, he was, he was never so popular when he was living that he became after his death. So I, I, I call them dead gurus, right? And if you, if, you, if you just go through the interview of his son, his son, his son was an analyst with a, with a brokerage company in Boston. His son said that, that my father couldn't, couldn't provide for family through trading. It was, it was through selling of courses and seminars that he could provide for the family. And he left one lakh dollar estate for the family to live upon. So everything adds up, you know, you, you understand that, yes, analysis is, is not the way. Analysis, if you go too deep into analysis, you become a seller. You know, it's too much analysis works only for one person, the seller, the salesman who's selling this, that analysis, not for trader. So now, what's, the as kind, you said, what's the kind of a modern so-called guru that you are actually seeing is very common right now at this current point in time? You know, I think people have, have grown too intelligent to accept a guru at this point of time. Uh, most of the people these days, you know, the millennials, if I say so, so the millennials are, are very, very intelligent. They don't accept anything just like that, you know? And, 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 and I think that, that's what TFS is trying to do. If you, if you just go through the, the, the posts that we do on, on TFS, we, we tell everybody that stop looking for any guru. In fact, you know, when I tell that, people think of me as a guru. <laughs> and I say, you know, this is, this is defeating the purpose. I'm, I'm here to tell you to be self, self-dependent. So, you know, read, read books, think more. I always, you know, I always tell people that R&D, research and devel development, is the key for any company, right, to grow. Similarly, R&T, reading and thinking, is the key for any individual to grow. So r and is the only way that you go through life. Okay, now coming back to your question, you know, once I, once I read Douglas and the, the biggest thing, the biggest shift in my mindset, it was that, you know, losses are bound to happen. It's a, it's a distribution curve of, of wins and losses. You can do nothing about it. You can just contain your losses, right? You cannot control your, your, your outcome on trade to trade basis. You see, if, if, if you see the, the biases, you know, people don't, don't cut their losses, people book their profits too soon, people are, are apprehensive before putting a trade. Every single bias has a single reason, Philip, if I tell you. That single reason is that they attach too much importance to every trade, right? So everybody has a jackpot mentality. They think that the next trade is going to change my life. The next trade will enable me to leave my job and become my own boss. When you think like that, you know, you are bound to have too many biases in your head. So what I learned, the shift that I got from reading Douglas was that your next trade owes you nothing. In fact, you, when, when you put, your, put a trade, expect it to be a losing trade, right? You have an edge because you are doing some analysis, you have an edge, and over a period of time, your edge will play out. So before you, I, I will say, before you read Douglas, you are a gambler. After you read Douglas, you become a casino. <laughs> so Douglas teaches you to think like casino. You know, if you, if you take a game of blackjack, a casino has an edge of 4.5% over the players. So to any, any, any beginner, any novice, if I, if I tell that casino has an edge of 4.5%, he will think it's a small edge. No, it's not a small edge. You know, if $100 million are wagered, the casino will make $4.5 million. So they know that for a big, on a big sample size, we will make money. 
they don't try to control trade on uh, trading on you know gambling on 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 bet to bet basis so similarly i stopped i stopped thinking from trade to trade perspective and now you know if you ask in terms of analysis the analysis that i do i used to count waves earlier you know i was a wave if you say so i don't do that anymore i i see a chart you know i see a chart as just a, a battleground of buyers and sellers i i don't need to to make it too decorative using too many lines and too many things i see a chart as a as a group of buyers and sellers and i i try to identify using some very very classical technical analysis principles areas of demand and supply right and you know when you look at those areas you get you get your answers and and that's and and you you since you are not in a trade to trade basis mindset you don't have to analyze much you know what you have to do is people ask me about my most favorite trade setup in fact this is a question that i get the most on twitter on facebook everywhere that what is your most favorite trade setup and 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 i disappoint them you know with my answers because because they think that i am going to tell you that okay when when a 10 day moving average average crosses above a 50 day i i don't do that so my answer is that my most favorite trading setup is when i get an opportunity you know where the risk of being wrong is within 2% of my capital size you know the point of being wrong let's say i feel that this is a long opportunity and this is a point where i where the trade thesis goes wrong if the distance between my entry and distance between the point of being wrong is within 2% this is a wonderful trade setup you know people ask what's what's the target that you set i mean target if you ask me what's the target i think setting a target is an arrogant way to deal with markets i don't know where the price will go you know when i'm saying i don't know i think it can cost me a lot of followers people will think oh this guy knows nothing but yes i don't know i don't i really don't know what the price will do next the only thing that i have control over is my loss and and i i make sure that i i i execute full control over that that controllable variable and if if market moves in my favor i just keep going with it so that's all i mean so the biggest lesson for every beginner out there is please stop looking at trading from a trade to trade basis trading is not done in that fashion trading is having an edge and edge means analysis that you do you know any small analysis if you if you do moving average it's okay if you do fibonacci it's okay if you do rsi it's okay you know there is no holy grail you can do anything that analysis gives you an edge and that edge plays out over a large number of trades so you have to have money management in place so that you can live through those large number of trades i think that's that's something that i want to convey every to everyone i see so mm -hmm. at that point in time when the second enlightenment came along uh um, do you do you refine your strategy what kind of trader are you were you a intraday trader were you a swing trader or were you like a longer term position trader and and how would you say or think that which kind of time frame is is actually suitable for like beginner traders how should they consider what's their consideration factors when when thinking about this okay um you know since i came from investing background and and i didn't think good of trading so to start with i i started trading in in cash segment i started taking delivery of the, the shares that i was trading in and and i started doing positional trading and swing trading but you know down the line i i think day trading is not something that you know you can start with it's not that this is swing trading this is day trading and you are a beginner and you can start with this no it it cannot happen that way day trading you day trading is something that you evolve into you know you don't you don't become a day trader in the first place you have to know trading you know it's my if you ask any of my student if you ask anybody who follows me he can tell you that i always ask are you a trading beginner or are you a day trading beginner you know you cannot be a trading beginner and do day trading you you have to know what what is trading in the first place you have to you have to be profitable in swing trading only then you can graduate to day trading so i started with swing trading i started with positional trading then i shifted to day trading as well 
if I tell you the scenario as of now, my entire capital, I have an investing, I have an investing portfolio, right? I still do value investing because that thing works. You cannot say it does not work. It, it, it works big time. That works. And then a part of my portfolio is into trading. Within trading, I am more of a swing trader. I'm, I'm more of a, you know, I, uh, if you ask my, my, my uh, favorite time frame, my favorite time duration of a trade, it's somewhere between two, three days to a couple of weeks. So that's, that's the, the, the time that I play in. There is a reason I'll tell you about that. So, and then there is, there is, a, there is a small part of my business, which is day trading. What I personally believe is, you know, that the, the time duration of a trade, or let's say the time frame of a chart, it is inversely proportional to the randomness. When I say that, I mean that the higher the time frame, the lower the randomness. The lower the time frame, the higher the randomness. So when I'm looking at a daily chart, when I'm looking at a weekly chart, the randomness level is, is very, very low. You see, if you, are, if you are seeing a pattern, if you are seeing a head and shoulders, or if you are seeing a double bottom or a triangle, for that matter, anything, on a daily chart or a weekly chart, it plays out in a much better and reliable way on a daily and weekly chart than it does on a five minute or a 10 minute chart, right? There is too much noise there. So that the time frame <clears throat> of the chart is inversely proportional to the randomness, right? And the profitability of the trader, the profitability of the trader is also inversely proportional to the randomness. The lower the randomness, the higher the profits, right? So, I mean, this, this is something that can, can confuse any beginner. So I just repeat, if, if any beginner might, might, might want to write it down, he can do that. The time frame of a, of a chart is inversely proportional to the randomness. The randomness of any stock, any price is inversely proportional to the profitability. <clears throat> Therefore, the time frame is directly proportional to the profit. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so, so you, you, you mentioned that you were do, already doing pretty well doing like value investing. So what then is actually the motivation for you to want to spend additional time and effort to go into position trading, subsequently into swing trading and into intraday trading? Is it, that- it gives, me, it gives me capital to, to invest. Okay, so what do you mean by it gives you capital to invest? Is, th is it because by going shorter term, it helps you to generate returns more quickly? And that's why you will have more cash flow to actually invest, invest on a fundamental perspective? So what, what do you think is the, the pros or the, what attracts you to go shorter term then? <clears throat> you know, as, as, as I said, that when you invest, <clears throat> you are basically investing in the, in the growth of the company, right? And you are not running the company. So you have no control over the time period that, that you know, the returns will generate over. Uh, I have some investment, some invest, investments which have worked out over a period of five years, six years, seven years. But how will I get my cash flow? How will I sustain for those five, six, seven years? Trading, when you, when you put market in a chart format and you have different time frames to trade, right? You can control the time frame of your returns. That gives you more control, more control over your cash flows. So I use trading for my cash flows, and I, I, I you know, if you if you ask me for the last two years, I have not increased the size of my my trading portfolio. It's it's sort of a linear portfolio. Mm. So for six seven years, I was continuously increasing it, but now I have come at a point where I'm not adding anything. I'm not reinvesting my profits into trading. So my, my trading portfolio is at, at such a level, which is generating returns, which I'm comfortable with, right? So, and I'm, I'm, yeah. so generally, how do you actually, uh, actually in, in terms of percentage, why, how, how, how do you set a certain percent? How many percent do you like set for your value investing kind of portfolio? How many percent for position swing trading or intraday trading? So that I think that it gives a, a better perspective about how should uh, everyone else think about uh, uh, managing their trading and investing from a portfolio perspective? You know, to, to start with, Philip, I, I think my answer is going to disappoint a lot of beginners. To start with, if, if you know, I have to tell any beginner that how should he start doing trading? No day trading. You know, a beginner should not day trade. A trading beginner should not day trade at all. The reasons I have told you earlier, 
you know day trading is full of noise i am not saying it doesn't work it works i am making i am making money from day trading but it doesn't work for a beginner so a beginner should stick to swing trading to start with he should stick to swing trading and he should not he should not use derivatives if you ask me you know i'm 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 saying it's an example of saying something that i that i don't practice you know but i'm talking to a beginner personally i am a futures trader i trade futures and i trade both swing and intraday but if i if i have to tell any beginner on what to do please do not trade derivatives please do not trade intraday so it's it's a sure shot killer of of your career once you you know once you gather some experience in swing trading you start to feel markets in a better way you know you have knowledge about trading you have you have got control on your emotions you you know you are you, you are not suffering from fear or greed or or revenge or recovery you are not suffering from that then you can come on to day trading you know because in day trading there is no time to think if you if you get to thinking it's over you cannot think so that's why day, swing trading now if you ask me my uh, segregation of day trading and swing trading uh, i think it would be around 70% of my trading portfolio is in swing trading and some 30% 70% that that's where the returns are you know you know philip uh, most people don't agree and and let me tell you very very bluntly the reason that people promote day trading is because they have something to sell if you if you see the statistics the most billionaires in markets market business the most billionaires come from investing right most number of billionaires are from investing even from swing and positional trading there are a lot of billionaires but you can count billionaires from from day trading on your fingers right so it 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 doesn't it's it's not something that you can you know it's not a full business in itself day trading is something that can be part of your trading business it can be part of your trading business day trading cannot be your business this is what i have learned and i and i i really don't care if you know if you if if people uh, criticize me after listening to this because they have been hypnotized by the industry your broker your broker wants you to day trade because that's how he makes most of the commissions right so many gurus want you to day trade because that's how they sell their courses but a beginner should think for himself i have given you the i have given you a very very proven statistic you tell me the name of 10 billionaires from day trading you cannot do that because there aren't any even if you talk of traders like bruce covner traders like michael marcus traders like paul tudor jones traders like marty shorts are they purely day traders no they are not they are swing traders and they are swing traders who do day trading also so so that's my advice to any youngster you know will be first you have to know how to drive a car you cannot start learning to drive with a sports car right if you do that it's it's i mean you can have some adrenaline rush you can feel your hormones rushing up but you are you are set for a big accident you cannot you cannot start learning driving with a sports car you have to learn driving that's the first step drive for a couple of years you know without having any dent on your car once you can do that then gradually you can shift to sports car right but you cannot run sports car every day on your common roads so that's that's what my message is you cannot so, trade every so, day so how do you know at what point that uh, you can start looking into like intraday trading is there a certain stage where you know that you can do it and you should try it or how how do you identify that that point i think it's more of a you know qualitative intangible uh, feeling when a trader stops thinking you know you know when you I, i'll just extend the example of the car when you when you start learning how to drive a car every time you have to shift a gear you look at the gear you know you you look at the clutch you look at if your feet is pressing the right pedal your foot is pressing the right pedal so you have to get out of that you know when you when you start trading when you start taking decisions without thinking about them you know that's when you know that that analysis that trading psychology has 
has got fitted in your subconscious mind, right? Then you can start looking at day trading because you know day trading is not a game of analysis. It's a very blunt statement. Day trading is not a game of analysis. Day trading is a game of reflexes. You have to have very strong reflexes about market, right? Intuitions, if I may so say so. But what are intuitions? You know, most of the traders use the word that I have an intuition about this. What are intuitions? Intuitions are nothing but pop-ups, pop-ups from, from you know from the knowledge database that you have collected over a period of years. So when when you have a database of knowledge, when you have when you have had been when you have been trading for four or five years, you know you have understanding of how markets behave. Then I, I suggest you can you can lower your time frame and you know because there is lots of noise. When I when I do day trade, the biggest challenge, Philip, is is to segregate the randomness from non-randomness. Most of the patterns that form on intraday charts are random. You have to accept that. So if 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 you are if you are still suffering from bad trading psychology, if you still have to think, oh, what should I do when there is a head and shoulder? If you are still thinking about all these things, you are not ready for day trading. Day trading is something, yeah. When you don't have to think about anything, you know, it it it's it's something that, you know, there are four stages. The first stage is unconscious incompetence. You don't know what you don't know. The second stage is conscious incompetence. You know what you don't know. Right. The third stage is conscious competence. You know what you know, but you are continuously thinking about it. The fourth stage is unconscious competence. You know, when when a when a pianist when he plays a song on piano for an audience, is he thinking about which which key to press now? He's not thinking about it. That's day trading for you. Okay, you so think. So if we let's uh, let's go back a bit more to swing trading because that I think is what will be the most ideal. Uh, a, a strategy or the time frame for most people to start with. So if let's say I am a new trader right now and I say, Nishan, I, I, I think that what I agree with you, I am new and I think tr uh, swing trading is something I should start with. So what do you think are the step-by-step the, the -step process? If you could just summarize quickly, how can I start to get into swing trading on the right foundation? What are the things I need to take note of and what are the things I need to think about so that I, I can be set up in the right fundamental way to become a proficient swing trader tr uh, swing trader see the first thing i'll suggest is you know uh, i have uh, personally i i suggest that there is a sequence of how you look at a chart right looking at a chart is very very important but how you look at the chart there is a sequence most people when they open a chart the first thing that they do is they jump to find patterns you know oh there is a head and shoulder i have to go short there Oh, there's a cup and handle, I have to go long there. So first you have to shed that mentality if you really want to become a proficient trader. The first thing that I personally look at is price structure. So price structure is the first thing that I look at. I'll come to that, that what do I mean by price structure? The second thing is price patterns, right? The third thing is individual candle patterns. The fourth thing is indicators, if, if any. But the irony is that most traders begin from the fourth and they never reach the first. So, you know, it's, it's like you are, you are missing a forest for trees. You are too busy looking at price patterns that you miss the big picture. So the first thing that I'll, I'll encourage everybody to learn, if anybody wants to become a swing trader, first try to understand the character of the price. You know, when I say character of a price, you don't need any indicator for that. You don't need any oscillator for that. You just need a price structure and you have to understand, you know, that, that, okay, is this stock stock more prone to be traded in ranges? Does it trend most of the time? Right. When it rises, does it rise steeply? When it falls, does it fall steeply? What happens? What has happened over, over the history? When it falls steeply, does it form a range there or does it form a V bottom? You know, the reason I'm saying all this, that the, the big parties, the big hands in a company, in a stock, they rarely change, Philip, right? Same set of people are managing a stock for a long period of time. 
so when 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 same set of people are managing a stock you have to see you have to you know there is no other way that you see common patterns all across the i mean we all we all see charts there are certain stocks which tend to make big candles there are certain stocks which tend to make small candles so this is getting into the skin of the stock you have to have get in the skin of the stock the soul of the stock once you do that then you look at the patterns right then you look at the patterns patterns i must say they are not some isolated structure you know in vacuum patterns don't exist in vacuum they exist as part of a structure so that's why i i i focus more on the structure first you see patterns but every pattern can fail that's you know i when i when i read bulkowski and bulkowski encouraged me to measure everything in you know in percentage stages and 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 inches i think that's a you know it can help you if you are if you are doing a job in in, in an analysis company you know it won't help you much if you are a trader so so you you learn patterns some very very basic patterns are enough then you get on to the price candle patterns you see that okay most people you know if most i i talk to more than 100 beginners every day i think you also see that you are part of tfs you know you must be seeing that that how busy we are answering queries so most beginners what they do is they see okay this is a morning star now the price will rise this is not how it works right so first there is structure a big structure then there are patterns then there are candlesticks and then indicators if you need now if this isn't complex already add to it the interplay of time frames you see most beginners miss this picture you have to understand you see uh, everybody asks everybody oh this is the chart how should i enter where should i enter where should i exit everybody's time frame is different everybody's personality is different everybody's capital size is different right so and 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 market exists in every time frame there is a market there is a market in 5 minutes there is a market going on in 10 minutes there is a market going on on weekly and and a stock can be in a wonderful uptrend on weekly and a stock can be in a pathetic downtrend on 5 minutes so there is no point asking anybody what should i do nobody knows what you are looking at the same stock is making a different thing i mean a, a flag a flag on a 5 minute chart can be part of a triangle on daily chart that triangle on a daily chart can be part of a big head and shoulder on weekly so you know you have to keep your eyes open that's that's what i tell everybody and that's my personal style of trading as well i i personally if if you ask me that what kind of trader i am my trading style is interplay of time frames and you see i uh, if i have to name a trader you know whom i feel most closest to me in terms of how we see price it has to be brian shannon do you know brian um i heard about him before but i have not really gone deep into uh, what he does the way he trades and stuff like that okay so brian brian shannon is is also advocate he also advocates the philosophy of interplay of multiple time frames right and that's what i do you know if if i if i just have to tell you one of my my strategy that how i look at it let's say there is a let me tell you another good thing another small nugget of wisdom for for beginners out there most people think that if if they are day trading right if they are day trading on 10 minutes or 15 minutes or 30 minutes they don't have anything to do with weekly charts no it's it's not that you have to see the daily and weekly even if you are day trading the reason is that you know when you day trade you should know the levels which are very very important so if if i have a strong resistance on weekly chart at a price level i have to be aware of it while i am day trading because even if the day trading the 5 minute chart is bullish i would i would have a sudden crash on 5 minutes and i won't know why the answer lies is that the weekly chart has a resistance there so so you know that's that's how my personal trading goes that i do and i suggest that trading cannot be one dimensional market exists in in so many time frames you have to see everything so generally what you are advocating is that 
even if you are a shorter term trader, you should look at a bigger time frame to get a big picture. Then after that, you narrow down to the smaller time frame to find the precise uh, signal, the precise entry levels. Is that generally what you are trying to advocate? Yes, and one, one more thing, you know, let's say there is a there is a good uptrend on, on 10 minutes chart, right? It's an uptrend and, and I'm getting a trade at, on the long side. But if the daily chart is bearish, I don't trade. I don't take a long trade. So it, it filters out, you know, even if there's an opportunity, because if, if the daily chart is saying something else, it will, it will take no time for your small chart to, to, dis, to be destroyed. You mm. see? So I always, I always trade in the direction of the long, longer frame. That's, that's one of the filters that I use. I see. So <laughs> what are some of the scenarios of, principles that you depend on to make a decision where, okay, this trade, I want to, I want to, I want to get into this trade. What are some of the principles behind making these decisions? Okay. Um, you see, I, I, I am more of a manual scavenger. A lot of people ask me what screeners I use. I, I, I really don't use any screeners. So uh, I am a futures trader. And uh, when I talk of future stocks, there are a little less, little more than 200 stocks. And, and to tell you, 200 stocks are nothing to, you know, you can see 200 charts every day. It's, it's very easy. If you have your fixed chart patterns, charts, chart setup, you can see 200 charts every day. So what I do is that every day that the market, when the market ends, that's when my work begins, right? I, I go through 100, 100 or so charts every single day. And, you know, there are certain charts that you feel that there is no trade. You know the chart. The chart structure is not looking good. The chart pattern is not looking good. There is there. It, it's it's more sideways, or I should say random. You know the structure is looking random, and and there is no entry structure near to the. You know you there is no entry point that is suggesting. I I have three lists. One list is NTZ. NTZ means no trading zone, right? So I I put stocks in no trading zone every on every day basis, right? Then there, there are charts which are good charts. You know, they're offering good, uh, it's a good structure, good pattern. And, and I see that, okay, it's trending or it's, you know, it's in a range, but it's a good structure. But I'm not getting a good entry. The price is, is the price is not, not favoring to take an entry, right? So those are TTZ, tentative trading zone, right? So one is no trading zone, one is tentative trading zone. And then there are charts. Which, which look good in terms of structure and patterns, and where the price is also at a point where risk is least. That is the key point. You know, entry should be at a point where the risk should not be more than 2-3%. And when I say risk, I, I don't use money stops, right? It's not that I can only lose this much. Market does not know how much I have to lose. So my, my stops are all, always technical stops. Right. So on, on the longer, if I, if I have to go long, my stop has to be at a point where the chart tells that the longer long side thesis is, is finished. So there are stocks where I see that the chart pattern is good and I'm getting a technical stop within two, 3% of my capital. They are immediate trading zone. So end of the day, I, I have come up with three categories. One is trading zone. One is no trading zone. And one is, tentative trading zone, right? Mm. Next, day, when the market starts, the tentative trading zone, they are my swing trade candidates, right? So I can take entry on, in, in those stocks on a longer basis, longer frame basis. But to tell you the truth, I day trade only in those stocks, you know? But you, you know, as, as it goes, swing trading is more about momentum but day trading is more about volatility. So even if the chart is looking perfectly fine, you have got a good entry. If the stock doesn't move, there is no day trade. So what I do is that I take my, my immediate trading list and out of that list, those stocks, you know, which have gapped up or which have broken out of a range or where there's a volume spike or there is an open interest spike, they become my day trading candidates. So, so I hope beginners so, understand this. So yeah. your day trading uh, list of stock is actually from the same list as your swing trading stocks as well. Absolutely. Same list, which, which, which shows more volatility. 
Okay, I see. Okay. So let's say if right now, let's go back to the swing trading part again. Huh? So if let's say I've done my analysis and based on this list of swing trading stocks, I noticed that hey, this particular stock, I think this is the right time to get in because the momentum is starting to, to run. Okay, and I look from the chart, okay, uh, this is the level. If it, if, it, if, it, if, it, if it doesn't run and it comes back to this level, that is where my technical stop is. That shows that probably I'm wrong. That's where my technical stop is going to be. So I have my entry, I have my stop. What is the next step you will do thereafter? In like, do you actually start to size the trade and decide how many shares to buy and how do you go around doing that? You know, uh, Philip, I, I practice something called fresh look strategy. Every time my, my stock hits a stop or every time I book profits, right? There are only two ways to exit, right? When you exit in profits, when you exit in losses. So every time I get out of a position, I don't forget it, right? I look at the chart as if I am seeing it for the first time. There are, the, the biggest mistake that people do is that they get attached to a name. So let's say you are trading Apple. They know that they are trading Apple. You know, they get attached with the name of Apple. And if they get stopped out, they know that they have got stopped out in Apple. That's a big bias. That's a big bias. So when I, when I get stopped out, I immediately look at the chart again. If my thesis is wrong, it means there still is a trade. If there is momentum, if there is volatility, see, I, if you, if you, if you read Paul Tudor Jones, PTJ himself said that sometimes, you know, it takes five, seven attempts to get an entry. So, so that's what I believe in. You know, I, I, I don't think if I'm stopped out that I'm wrong, it, I do I won't trade in this stock. I, I look at it from a, from a completely fresh angle. Mm. All right. So um, then how would you advocate a, a, a swing trader or a generally new swing, swing trader? What are the kind of ways of profit taking you think he can, he can consider? What, what kind of methodology do you think he can consider in, in terms of profit taking? See, there are, there are only two scenarios, you know, overall that you, that any swing trader can trade in. First thing I would like to say that, you know, markets are very, very unstructured in its, in, in its overall uh, structure. It's they are in unstructured. So you have to be structured in your mindset. When you look at a chart, when you look at a chart, you have to be sure, you have to be sure about, you know, whether, whether this is a trend trade or this is a range trade. If this is a trend trade, is it a trend continuation trade or is it a trend reversal trade? If this is a range trade, is it a support resistance respect, respecting the support trade or is it a sp support and resistance breakout trade? So I, 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 I personally, you know, when I take a trade, I know the category of the trade that I'm taking, right? So when I'm looking at a chart, if I'm, if I'm trading a range, I know what I'm trading. Am I tra trading a support resistance trade or am I trading a breakout trade, right? And there are different sets of probabilities, different sets, sets of money management principles and risk management principles associated with every single category. Mm. Right? So generally when you get into a trade, do you have a profit target in mind or do you like use trailing stop or? or... You know, when uh, there is a, I, I would have to say that it depends upon whether the trade is a range trade or a trend trade. You know, in a, in a, in a trend trade, I, I tend to have very, very tight stops and, and, you know, somehow big quantity because the point of being wrong is very, very close to your entry point. However, in 10 trades, you know, I, I keep my quantity a little small and I give a lot of space to the trade to work, to de develop. Now talking about the, the targets in terms of a range trade, you know, you don't have much same targets. You have to get out, you know, the moment you see something going wrong. But in a trend trade, I mean, you have to give it a benefit of doubt. There are certain pullbacks. I mean, every deep pullback is not a reversal, right? So there are pullbacks, which are pullbacks, but they look like reversal. So you have to be little, uh, you know, little, you have to give little space for the trade to develop. So if you ask me that, how should a trader do in terms of booking out profits? <clears throat> I would say, do not get out. Let the market take you out. Mm. So okay. That's, that's what I do. I see. Okay. So if we can like 
zoom out a bit, uh, and not, not going too much details into it, let's go out, zoom out a bit. So there's this particular saying that um, there are like uh, uh, more than 90 or even 95% of traders lose money in the long run. So what's your take on that? Do you think that is generally true? And, and, and it, it seems like it's a, it's a very demoralizing thing to think about. What, what's your thought on that? And how would you advise any trader or new traders that look at this number and start to think, oh, the chances of me being profitable is going to be so low that I might as well don't try it. So what's your take on that? You know, most traders, when they enter, when we started TFS, too many, and I started suggesting books to start with. You know, I started suggesting books to everyone. Too many people told me that you will not get any members, right? You will not get any follower because people just don't want to learn. They want to, they want to have tips. And I was so wrong. I mean, look at it. We have 16,000 members. So this is the biggest gap, you know, that is there when people start. The reason why 95% of traders fail is, you know, I'm sorry to say, but the industry as a whole disappoints them. You know, if you have to become a doctor, you have a, you have a set of prescribed books, a syllabus that you have to cover in order to become a doctor. But when you want to become a trader, what does your broker tell you? Your broker says, sir, please open an account with me and, and please trade in derivatives. That's where the big money is. And you know, please do, please trade options. Options make you richer. So it's, it's, I won't say that, you know, it's, it's, it's not entirely fault of traders. The industry as a whole has to take some responsibility. And, and that is why I started TFS. You know, I, 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 I thought that the responsibility, I have to take responsibility first. If I, if I want to preach about, you know, people should take responsibility. So 95% traders fail one because they have wrong expectations from the market, right? Most people think, that they can double their money like that. I mean, I can tell you, Philip, if, if, if as a trader, you are making 30% yearly on a CAGR basis, a big institutional trader, he will give his first born son to have returns like that. Right? But if I tell a beginner that, look, 30% profit is, 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 you know, this is what you can earn, he will say, oh, just that, just 30%? I thought it should be 100%. So, so this is what, first, wrong expectations. Second, they, they blame markets for, you know, for their uh, failures and, and success. Success they take credits for, but failures they blame markets. That is true. And third, you know, most of the people who come to trading, they are already in some professions. So let's say there's a doctor, or let's say there's a lawyer, and he comes to trading. Just think of the mindset. Here is a guy who passed college with good marks, right? Who, who learned, who learned a lot of things to become a doctor, who has a respectable position in the society, right? He has been a winner in life. Now, when he comes to trade, he expects the same from the, from the market. How can I lose? This is, this is, you know, if you, if you can't lose, you will lose. So this is, this is the, the first principle that is there. You have to accept losses as I said earlier, that it's, it's a trading is a game of large sample of trades. It's not trade to trade basis. That's one. Second, you should take full responsibility of trading. Third, you should not be expecting too much in terms of returns. If 25, 30% returns are, are not enough to run your household, then you have got small principal amount to start with in the first place. You know, most people focus on the R of the return equation. They don't focus on the, on the principle P. They don't focus on the N number of years. So that, that's, I think there's a big disconnect between what a trader wants from the market and what market is. It is a cutthroat business like anything. If you look at companies in the world, do they make more than 25, 30%? No, they don't do. I personally have some years where I make three digit returns, but making three digit returns is not, cannot be generalized. You see? It's more of so an outlier event that happens. Outlier, yeah. yeah. So, 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 so 95 percent traders lose money because they don't take responsibility of their outcomes, because they expect too much from trading, because they are undercapitalized. You know, this is a very, very, this is something that most people don't think about. They think 
that they can just bring $500 or even $1,000 or even $2,000 and they will convert it into 1 million. You know, because they read market wizards and, and they read that Richard Dennis converted $200 into a million, they think that they will be the next Richard Dennis. So this is, this is not, this is the wrong expectation to have. And most beginners, they, they start with intraday. You know, this is something that I want to discourage among all the beginners. Intraday is not something that you start with. Intraday is something that you evolve into. You know, I started day trading after three years of trading. And I still don't day trade every day. Day trading is still a part of my business. And I meet, I talk to a lot of big traders, you know, internationally. And, and everyone, everyone has the same opinion. Day trading is part of their business. It's not their business. So if, if, if a beginner follows these things, one, follow the bigger time frame, right? Because randomness is lower. Two, do not day trade. Three, accept responsibility, complete responsibility. And fourth, accept the risk. Do not trade on trade to trade basis. I think if, 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 a, if any beginner, you know, truly accepts these four points, he will be, he will already be being in those 5% segment of winning trades. I see. All right, Nishan, I really love to engage you and, and have, I, actually I have a lot more questions I wanted to ask you, but time is running short and I suppose that we will definitely have opportunities to do more interviews so that I can get more about your thought process and translate them into something that is going to be useful for whoever is watching uh, the, the, your interview video. So, but before we end off today's um, interview with you, is there any uh, last words you have for the summit participants, especially those that is um, starting off as a generally new and inexperienced trader? Any kind of um, advice or inspirational thing that you can share with them so that they can persist through the initial tough periods of trading and hopefully one day they will be able to see daylight sooner uh, uh, compared to just simply giving up like what most of the 95% of the traders does. Do you have any like last words for the, for the summit participants? Yes. So the first thing is that, you know, read a lot. You have to read a lot and you have to think a lot. Merely reading will not help. Like, you know, Philip, I, I just like to take this opportunity to say us, to tell a small analogy. Most trainers, you know, they give a wrong analogy. They say that trading is like swimming. And you cannot learn swimming by reading. I say this is a pathetic analogy. Trading is like brain surgery. Of course, you need practical exposure, but you need to read a lot of books before that. Right? So, so my advice to beginners is that read a lot, think a lot, right? Don't be like anybody. You have to, you know, it's your, it's you. So you have to have your own trading systems. You have to have, you know yourself better. So that's one. Second is, please switch off your televisions, right? If you want to become a trader, you would want to be away from that noise. Do not get caught in traps of, the moment you hear anybody using words like magic strategy, like zero, zero failure method, just run away. You know, it's, it's not true. Analysis is not the answer. Manage your risks. Profits will take care of themselves. And, and last but not the least, it's, it's, you know, beginners think in terms of profits, profit, uh, in terms of winning and losing. Whereas professionals, they think in terms of profits and losses. If you ask me, my, my, my last year, Philip, 2017, it was, the, it was one of the greatest year of my trading life, 2017, right? And I had 40% win rate. So this is, this is something that I want to tell everybody. Please stop obs obsessing about winning every trade and read a lot. So reading, is, reading and thinking, R and T, is the way to go. I see, I see. Yes. All right, thank you so much again, Nishan, for the, 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 the time that you have spent trying to dispense your wisdom and your experience to the summit participants. Uh, I believe that after watching your interview, they will go back and think deeper about it and hopefully most of them will start reading. And uh, I hope <laughs> you have a chance to interview you again in the future to chat and more in-depth in in topics about trading. But for now, 
I wish you all the best in whatever that you are doing and in terms of the kind of vision you want to achieve for TFS. And uh, let's have a chance to chat again. All right, Nishan, thank you again so much for your time. It's a, it's a pleasure, Philip. And, and, you know, to tell you the truth, we will need at least four or five more sessions together. You know, I have, I have a lot more to say and, I, and I'm sure you have a lot more to ask. Definitely, right? definitely. Yes, we will but definitely. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. It's, it's, it's truly honorable. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm, so, I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nishan. Take care.